China's economy has performed better than expected so far this year, with industrial output and retail sales both outperforming forecasts. Despite this, though, the Chinese government is cautioning that domestic demand remains insufficient. To talk more about this, I'm joined by Michael Pettis. He's a senior fellow at the Carnegie China Centre and professor of finance at Peking University. Michael, industrial output up more than 7%, retail sales up 5.5%. What was behind this better than expected growth? Well, you know, there, was, uh, there were several attempts late last year to implement policies that would boost both the demand side and the supply side. And they seem to have come true, but it's very difficult to base too much on the first two months of the year. As you know, we have the Chinese New Year, which often distorts the data. For me, the key point of the recent data uh, was that the gap between production and uh, uh, consumption continued to expand. And that's really the problem that China faces. Yeah, maybe you could explain to us a little more. You've been looking at the relative importance of investment and consumption as a share of GDP. Can you explain in as simple terms as possible how China is an outlier here compared to other economies? Yeah, China implemented a policy which wasn't particularly Chinese. Many other countries have implemented this policy in which they force up domestic savings and force up domestic investment. And that was a very successful policy in the 1980s, 1990s, when China was hugely underinvested. But about 10, 15 years ago, it closed the gap between the investment it could use and the investment that it was actually delivering. And as a result, we saw an, a, a surge in debt. Now, China's trying to bring that investment under control, but it's really extraordinarily high. You know, globally, uh, investment is about 25% of GDP. In low investing countries, uh, the US, Europe, some developing countries, it's around 18 to 20%. And in high investing countries, it's around 32 to 34%. But in China, it's 43%. So their over-reliance on investment was good 20 years ago, 15 years ago, not so good now when more and more of this investment is non-productive. So the two big sources of demand in any a large economy are consumption and investment, which is why there's so much talk in China about trying to raise the consumption share as you bring down the investment share. Two things I want to pick up on there. For the first thing is, why is this investment no longer productive? Um, they just made too much of it. Um, we saw that in the property sector where they built uh, uh, houses everywhere. In Europe, you saw something quite similar 10 years ago in Spain, where buildings were popping up everywhere, even in places they would never be used to take advantage of the uh, property price bubble. Uh, but in China, it's more than that. China has spectacular infrastructure. It's probably got the best infrastructure in the world and better than it needs for its level of development. Yet it continues to build infrastructure because that's sort of an easy way to generate uh, economic activity. More recently, We've seen a huge shift of investment into the manufacturing sector. Now, that may sound like a good thing, but China already manufactures far more than it can absorb. China is about 17% of, of, of the global economy. It only uh, uh, comprises 13% of global uh, consumption, but it already comprises a, a, an astonishing 31% of global manufacturing. And so as they continue expanding manufacturing capacity, that creates the problem for countries like Germany and the rest of the world about who's going to absorb all of that manufacturing. And that brings me to the second point. So if other countries aren't going to buy all of this overproduction, how is the Chinese government going to spur demand domestically? There's only one way. There, well, there, there is an unsustainable way, which is to borrow money, give it to the household sector and let them spend it, uh, which China has been very reluctant to do. And there's the sustainable way, which, frankly, we've been talking about since 2007 and haven't been able to do. And that is you have to shift income away from those groups that, that benefited disproportionately towards the household sector, because it's basically households that consume. So we need a major shift of income away from other parts of the economy towards the household sector. And as I don't need to tell you, a major shift of income is politically very, very hard to pull off in any economy. So, so is this going to involve the super rich giving away their wealth to, to the, the middle class? 
In the U.S., that would be the way the way to solve it, uh, because the problem of income inequality is the rich have too much and the, the middle class and the poor have too little. In China, they have that problem, but they have an additional problem. And that is the government retains roughly 20 percent of GDP, which is very high. Most governments are closer to zero. So you need also a shift of income from government, mainly local governments, to the household sector. And that's probably the more important shift and the more difficult shift. Sure. Now, of course, China does, of course, want other countries to buy more of its goods as well. But its international image at the moment is uh, not so easy. It's been struggling to attract foreign direct investment. What does a country need to do to improve that? Well, uh, foreign investors in China and, and direct investors in China are concerned about uh, a difficult external environment. They're concerned about the slowdown in the Chinese economy. And they're concerned about uncertainty relating to government policy. Uh, all of those things have to be resolved before we see a major uh, resurgence of foreign direct investment. But, you know, I disagree with many of my colleagues here who say that that's a big problem. China's problem is way too much savings. It can fund anything it wants to do domestically. I don't think it needs foreign investment to the extent that many people, including in the government, believe that it uh, that it does. Interesting. So your argument is really it just needs people to buy more stuff. I want to stay with that issue of geopolitical relationships, though, because they are very tense right now. China recently announced it was phasing out US microprocessors from Intel and AMD from government PCs and servers. How significant is this move? Well, you know, we tend to overemphasize the importance of the high tech sector in the overall economy. And I think that's something that's happening in China, too. Uh, these things matter. They probably matter for security reasons more than for economic reasons. But at the end of the day, uh, most economies, uh, even the US, which is generally considered the most high tech dependent economy, it's a very small part of the economy that depends on the high tech side. What China really needs to focus is on, you know, men pulling wheel, pushing wheelbarrows or people delivering food on bicycles. That's where we have to increase productivity. The tech side is, uh, I think, a lot of bragging rights, but I don't think it's key to the, uh, to the development and adjustment of the economy. Interesting. Definitely not an argument I hear very often. I want to end by asking you about your predictions for the next few years, especially from the perspective of young people who may be about to enter the labor market. What can they expect in terms of economic opportunities next few years? Well, you know, it's a big joke in, uh, in, in most of the top universities that had they been smart, they would have graduated 20 years ago because um, in those days it was so easy to be successful. It's quite difficult now. There's a lot of uh, anxiety among university students. But in the longer term, and, and, and what really matters is the longer term, the key issue is how China goes through the adjustment. There are better ways it can do it and there are worse ways it can do it. And uh, if we're able to shift to the better ways, there'll be a slowdown in growth, but not necessarily a slowdown in the most interesting parts of the economy, uh, for example, consumption growth, things like that. So we'll see what happens. The key really is how Beijing manages the transition. All right. And we'll be watching that very carefully. Michael Pettis from the Carnegie China Center. Thank you so much.